Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPD to advance excellent teaching. Our elders are fair game, it would seem, for an aberrant faction of our society. Why would this young reporter bind her hands and feet and wander city streets as an 80-year-old? What does it mean to age in our society? Do we all go through the same physical and mental stages as we grow older? Maturing and aging, this time on Discovering Psychology. From birth to death, we all pass through many stages. But until fairly recently, most important theorists who influenced the study of psychological development focused primarily on early life. They believed that after adolescence, the psyche was basically set, with only a few important changes left to come. It wasn't until the 1950s that research on aging really began with research on the various stages of adulthood starting shortly after. Since then, a great many myths about growing older and maturing have been overturned. One of the most valuable concepts emerging from psychological research is that of lifespan development. The idea that many aspects of human nature continue to develop throughout the entire life cycle. In this context, Development isn't the same as growth. It includes both growing up and winding down. As we come to the end of our life, for example, there's what we call biological senescing, growing older physically, but also the possibility of psychological adolescing, growing up and developing psychologically to our full potential. Eric Erickson of Harvard University helped redirect developmental psychology toward the entire life cycle. His insights into the crises of identity came out of his own experiences as a newcomer to the United States. Because as an immigrant, I faced one of those very important redefinitions that a man has to make who lost his language, his, where all the, the references on the basis of which his uh, his language, his uh, concepts, and so on. His sensory and sensual impressions were based. Erickson identified eight stages of psychosocial development, from birth to late adulthood, in which the individual is challenged by specific crises or conflicts. Each stage is defined by a developmental task. The individual must come to terms with two opposite demands, balancing or integrating them. For the young adult, the conflict is between isolation and intimacy, the ability to make a full commitment to another person. This requires accepting responsibilities and giving up some privacy and independence. Failure to resolve this developmental crisis can lead to isolation, to a lack of meaningful psychological connections with other people. Research indicates that anything which isolates us from sources of social support can leave us at risk for a number of physical and mental problems. Hi, Doreen. The next crisis and like opportunity that. for growth comes during the 30s and 40s. <laughs> during midlife, people usually move beyond the focus on self to wider commitments to family, work, and society. But for those who haven't resolved the earlier crises of identity and intimacy, there may loom ahead what's known as the midlife crisis. People in a midlife crisis are self-indulgent. They want to give up their commitments for one last fling, opting for freedom, or its illusion, at the expense of security and responsibility to others.
Erickson's eighth and final crisis comes at the end of the life course. If an individual has resolved the crises of earlier stages, he or she can look back without regrets to enjoy a sense of wholeness. But when there are too many crises unresolved, too many aspirations unfulfilled, the end is shadowed by futility, despair, and anger. At Yale University, Daniel Levinson has also been studying the life course as a sequence of developmental periods. I have proposed the following idea of the life cycle. I believe that it is, div it is divided into a series of eras, each lasting about 20 or 25 years. The first era is childhood. It goes until around 20. It includes what is ordinarily called childhood and adolescence. The second era I call early adulthood, which goes from around 20 to the early 40s. This is the time in which we are working to establish a place for ourselves as adults in society, forming a work for ourselves, uh, forming a family, raising our children, advancing toward youthful goals. The third era I call middle adulthood, which goes from roughly the early 40s to the early 60s. This is a time in which we become more senior members of the adult world. The fourth era I call late adulthood, which uh, goes from roughly the early 60s to the early 80s. Somewhere in our 60s, we begin moving out of the center stage of society. We, we're no longer having major responsibilities. We feel less obligated to do the kind of work we did earlier. We have the possibility of enjoying life more, being more playful. Uh, we also have the hazard of becoming irrelevant. So as I see it, the study of life structure development and a sense of developmental periods provides a context within which we can look at more specific problems such as work and family and leisure and religion and politics and so on. Uh, it, it doesn't fully explain any one of these, but it helps us to see their meaning more clearly and also helps us to interrelate them. At the end of the life cycle, we come, of course, to old age. But most of us have little understanding of what it's really like to be old. How do the elderly experience the changes they go through? And how are they treated by the rest of society? The average person's lifespan has increased by 30 years over the last century. Consequently, there is growing attention to the quality of life as one gets older and to what the elderly have to teach us about aging. How do you evaluate it? How do you describe it? The research of psychologist Laura Carsonson looks at how emotions are experienced and processed in our later years. ...of my life, I feel that things are very, are very much more in one piece that I get... In recent years, in part while scientists were searching for some of the problems associated with aging, they discovered some surprises. College-age students are more likely to be lonely than the elderly. Specifically, older people experience less negative emotion, fewer negative emotions than younger people do. Emotional problem solving and the ability to process complex emotions often improve with age. Carstensen has also found that cognitive agility in normal elderly adults does not necessarily decline. I'm going to have you look here at the computer screen and you're just going to see a series of pictures. Carstensen is studying how emotional stimuli can influence the cognitive processes in older adults, particularly in relation to memory. We're working on a project which were examining older and younger people's memory for emotional material. We have been examining people's relative memory for 
emotionally charged visual imagery as compared to neutral pictorial stimuli. Okay. And this time, if a picture comes on the screen that you saw in that first group, I'd like you to push yes. And if a picture comes on the screen that you didn't see, I'd like you to push no. no. And say Older people show the standard kind of age-related decline in their memory for neutral information, neutral stimuli, but not for the emotionally charged visual stimuli. In this case, older people's go. memory is just as good as younger people's memory. We have searched for age differences and where we see them, we assume that there must be age decrements. That is, if older people differ in some way from younger people, we say there's something wrong. I think in the area of emotional development, we see much evidence for growth and improvement well into the later years of life. Despite promising evidence that challenges the belief that getting older reduces the quality of life, fears of aging still persist. Perhaps the idea of aging threatens our illusion of eternal youth. You would think that the inevitable process of aging would elicit compassion and help from society instead of indifference and hostility. This videotape documents some of the experiences of Pat Moore, a young reporter who transformed herself into an 85-year-old woman and wandered the streets of over a hundred cities. She bound her legs to make walking difficult, taped her fingers to simulate arthritis, clouded her vision with contact lenses, and diminished her hearing with earplugs. She found it difficult to function in a world designed for the young and the fit. At one point, Moore was even attacked by adolescents. Our elders are fair game, it would seem, for an aberrant faction of our society that believes they can take what they want. And someone who is encumbered with a slow pace or loss of dexterity, low vision, loss of strength, and might have some money in their pocketbook is a very easy mark. So to say that I learned something that I didn't expect um, would be difficult, but to say that I was surprised by the extent of ageism in our society would certainly be a, a very accurate statement. What is developing in our society with the controlling force of the baby boom cohort is an attitude of we can cure aging. It's this retin-A generation of saying, I'm sure I'll be able to buy something that'll fix it. I will never be like my grandmother. The processes of biological aging that are genetically programmed are inevitable. But diet and exercise can retard the physical aspects of aging. And the psychological aspects can be greatly influenced by a variety of factors, including one's own expectations, one's sense of self-esteem and sense of personal control, as well as the ability to live independently or in a supportive communal setting. It may even be possible to modify some effects of aging with mental strategies designed to increase and 